Tonight, I want to wish a very special birthday to my daughters, Renata and Eliana, who turned 10 years old this very day. One is awake. One fell asleep before I started speaking. <laughs> Neither Ema nor I plan to celebrate this particular way with you, your brothers Aaron and Ari, and our family on Kol Nidre, Friday the 13th of all dates. <laughs> but I do want to say with all my heart, Yom Huledet Sameach, happy, happy birthday. May you live to be 120. This 120, Kanahora, Poo, poo, poo. <laughs> no, I'm not going to spit three times or throw salt over my shoulder. I'm pretty careful about black cats since I'm allergic. And I don't whistle at night, pay attention to crows hovering in the sky, point my fork at someone, open up an umbrella inside the house, or walk under a ladder. These are all a variety of superstitions. Baba Mises, as we observe Yom Kippur, we must ask, is our way of Judaism filled with superstition, or can we elevate our spirituality to heighten the meaning in our lives? Our reform forebears were greatly concerned about how superstitions focused our behavior, our thinking, and our feeling about Judaism. The Alenu prayer in our Union Prayer Book included the paraphrase, May superstition no longer enslave the mind, nor idolatry blind the eye. Our immigrant ancestors were heavily engaged in the rote superstitions of Judaism, some of which still appear on the front pages of the Los Angeles Times, like waving chickens around our heads. <laughs> waving those chickens, shlach kaporis, until that chicken dies, and that's how we get rid of our sins. That's not the unique spirituality of our heritage. As Reformed Jews, we wanted to change this, revised our prayers and our deeds to reflect our learning and our logic, our reason, and our being rational. We refused to pray or sing anything we couldn't actually believe or defend as real. Today, we must be careful not to let our rational side trample our spiritual feelings. Even the Kol Nidre was once denigrated as irrational, though its melody was beloved. Yet that haunting melody, the sound we return to each year, heightens a spiritual tranquility which we crave. It's what we're looking for in a world that sometimes leaves us behind. We worry about making a living, doing our errands, rushing around, getting angry and stressing out as we're stuck in traffic. And with the technology of cell phones and iPads and laptops, clocks even on our coffee makers and our toasters, life is no simpler. Science and technology have distanced us from that spiritual sense of comfort. When there was a limited amount of information to acquire, any educated human being could be knowledgeable about many subjects. Today, where an infinite number of messages are transferred from one computer to the next, with everything from business data to scientific theorems, to pornography, to gossip, to Torah study, channeled through the internet, this world has rapidly changed. Then, we knew more about less. Now, we know less about more. In this high-tech age, we need a high-touch response. So people return to the life of the spirit, to the ineffable qualities which nurture our souls. Spirituality is a word that only entered the Jewish community in the 90s. We had gained our civil rights, the Vietnam War concluded, our concern for the environment became normative, Israel had won its wars, Jews were freed from Russia and Ethiopia. With these global concerns seemingly resolved, people began to open up their faith and inner spiritual life. We rabbis became more liberated to speak and write about God. Many Jews embarked on their own spiritual journeys, and baby boomers focused more and more on the meaning of life, their own spiritual sparks. Spirituality, from my teacher Arthur Green, sees as its primary task cultivating and nourishing our human souls and spirits. It is integral to the Jewish religious experience. 
our Jewish spiritual renewal can sweep us heavenward. Many of us have felt extraordinary religious joy. We know the incredible nachas at a wedding, the amazing pride at a bar or bat mitzvah, even the ache of sadness at a funeral touches our spirits. It is possible for us to feel alive Jewishly, to grow in relationship with God. Those special Jewish family moments are part of our spiritual journey. And so many of you honored us with your comments about the great Hamish quality of our Rosh Hashanah services, a combination of music, of feeling at home, of warmth, of your bringing your spiritual and conscious intention to the moment, uniting our heads with our hearts. Spirituality combines our routine prayer with spontaneous emotion. It brings the full vitality of heart, body, mind, and soul together. That's very challenging. Seeking our spirituality through prayer is hard. It's tricky, for we may find it difficult to reconcile our God concepts with our worship. And honestly, it doesn't always work for me. I too can be tired, and there are times that I may not be emotionally moved. It may feel difficult or mechanical, and it's especially hard after an intensive counseling session or after coping with the loss of life. But then there are those moments that strike forth like lightning, and the music of prayer is like a smile from God. It emanates from the soul. It invigorates us. The music may remind us of our life experiences, the words may move us. Spirituality may be the propane, but religion is the lantern of its expression that bursts the flame into light. A rabbi was once asked by his students, what do you do before praying? The rabbi responded, I prepare for prayer. The students pressed their mentor and asked, how do you prepare? To this question, the rabbi replied, I pray that I may be able to pray properly. Prayer is our spiritual conversation, our encounter, our striking up a dialogue with God. And when we pray, the rhythm and cadence of the words themselves may be comforting, like those terrifying moments when we have to say Kaddish for our loved ones. Prayer helps us frame our lives, giving us an opportunity to think and reflect, to provide moments of introspection, just like that glorious silence we had earlier tonight in this world filled with too many beeps, buzzers, and bells. Because prayer can be challenging, we needed to revolutionize our worship to do something new and dynamic in our synagogue. And so we've prayed Shabbat at the beach. We've had Havdalah at the marina. We've had a meditation morning. We've walked with Torah off the beaten path. And these come from your responses to the concerns raised during the Joshua Project. Our new Saturday services provide an entree to Judaism, coping with our needs for healing at our healing Shabbat, learning about the very words in our book at our learner's minion, singing and praying with our children at tiny tefillah, getting a hands-on experience leading or reading or chanting in our participatory minion with a little brunch and Margaret's kugel to follow, as well as a quarterly time for meditation, quiet, and tranquility. We need our community. We need to gather together in song and prayer. And our Taste of Judaism class can open the door to spirituality, ethics, and community. But Rabbi, you may say, I'm spiritual, not religious. A noted mystic once described those who want spirituality without religion as wanting cream without the milk. We need to balance the richness of the cream with the sustenance of our milk. It's not a fad or the latest thing. We have to remember that at the core, ritual is the heart of spirituality. Spirituality is intensely personal and potentially profound, while ritual connects it and each of us to others. Community gives us the language and the life cycles the rites and the rituals of our heritage. In 1943, in the Skarishko concentration camp, the rabbi smuggled in a ram's horn and asked Moshe to sculpt it into a shofar. 
Moshe had never made a shofar. So he approached a devout Polish Catholic carpenter to help him. Moshe was able to work on it, and the Catholic carpenter assisted with tools and advice. One hour before Rosh Hashanah, Moshe finished the shofar. At dawn the next day, despite the blows they knew would follow, they sounded that shofar, now located in Yad Vashem. This simple mechanical act had great profound spiritual meaning for them, performing a ritual in the face of the oppressor, and the story of their courage moves us. Our ritual is the holy vessel into which we pour our spirituality. And our tradition speaks not only to the glory of the sunrise or the moon coming over a mountaintop, but also how we drive, how we use money, how we have sex or work, how we speak to neighbors and children. To learn that framework, our spiritual touchstone is Torah, where we turn for inspiration and insight to refract our experience with the world. The sacred text of Torah provides us with a lens to stare into our souls as it has done for over 250 generations. Moreover, Torah captures the divine light so we see ourselves more clearly and find a personal way to respond to the godliness in life. When we place a mirror in front of the text, we see our reflection in the lives of our ancestors. I had a congregant who wanted to learn more. He felt he was ignorant of Judaism, never had a proper education. He wanted to start on his path to spirituality and knowledge. He learned that to relate to the Torah is to enter the spiritual path of our ancestors, crossing the rivers with them, journeying up the mountain with them, trekking through the desert, feeling their pangs of thirst, empathizing with their sufferings or their exaltations of victory. When he paused in those rare moments to reflect on his own journey, he began to be enriched by the text and his life became interwoven with those who came before. As the text has left its imprint on me, I've also left my footprints along the path of my ancestors in the text and beyond. Our journey through the Sinai and the desert we call life become fused. The sacred text is a spiritual legacy, documenting the relationship of individuals with God through history. Through study, I am able to join my struggle with theirs. But study is not sufficient alone to engage our souls, our quest. It can be a solitary exercise. Study and prayer by themselves are not enough. We need to interact with the world around us. It's part of who we are and what we do as human beings, as Jews. The rabbis instructed us to build synagogues with glass windows that compelled us to maintain a perspective on the reality of the material world beyond the walls of the house of prayer, even while we are trying to gaze heavenward. This is especially important for those of us who attempt to balance our liberal religious lives with our feet firmly planted in this real world of ours with its vice and its virtues. Remembering to work to make the world a better place must guide our interaction with the world and shape our daily lives. A number of years ago, I traveled to Mississippi with a board of rabbis to repair the damaged homes and roofs following Hurricane Katrina. Okay, you're taking a deep breath right there wondering, our rabbi on a roof with electric tools and pneumatic hammers? That's how it was. And there I was with other clergy as well, interfaith leaders, priests, and rabbis, and ministers, organized by the interfaith religious community to match our words to deeds, to send missions of volunteers who acted on their spirituality for this action of tikkun olam. And that's why, friends, we roll up our sleeves on Big Sunday. It's why we work for immigration reform or against gun violence, why we march against genocide and require every bar and bat mitzvah to do its tzedakah project. We bring our confirmands to Washington, D.C., to the Litakin Seminar for Social Justice. Our Mechina class next year will be doing the Israel-LA AIDS Walk to live their Jewish life and connect it to this world. And you can do something to help tomorrow. Between noon and five, offer yourself five minutes to step down the hall and be tested for bone marrow registry, the possibility that you might have the secret stuff in your body 
to save someone's life. Now, there are two inherent dangers in the pursuit of spirituality. First, we need to be concerned about New Age spirituality that emphasizes red threads, crystals, or the Kabbalah Center's Mishigas, rather than a life devoted to prayer, ethics, and study. Secondly, we can't abdicate our responsibility to others as we seek our personal growth. Behind some who want to tap their inner power or find their true self is old-fashioned self-glorification. Like so much in our society, it's self-centered and narcissistic. Let me share a story about Rabbi Shnur Zalman of Liadi, who was studying in his son's house. The floor below, his grandchildren slept while his son studied nearby. The baby started crying, but the son was so involved with his study, he didn't hear his child cry. Distressed, Shnur Zalman descended the stairs, calmed the baby, and then sternly addressed his son. He said, you cannot reach the Holy One if you ignore the sounds of the cry of a baby. We can't be so focused on our holiness that we ignore a cry for help. We need to respond to such calls always. Schnur Zalman's lesson speaks directly to us, jars us, and draws us to redress society's wrongs. Friends, we need to speak of spirituality in our lives, our offices, our schools, and our homes. We can find ways to make God part of all that we do. If we truly want to make Judaism a way of life, something we live and breathe in our homes and on our way when we rise up and when we sit down, then we have to take our words meaningfully to heart tonight and act on them when we leave this house of God. Take one of the bags, fill it up with groceries, return it to this house of God so that we can do God's work in feeding the hungry. Turn our tables, friends, into altars of faith by offering a hamotzi or a bore prihagafen when we eat. Come into the temple or I'll join you in your home or in your office and we'll have a spiritual check-in to see how 10 minutes a day might be able to change your life. We are not a religion built on practicing our faith only within this building. The arena for spirituality is where we decide to let God in. There once was a woman who loved opals. Over the years, she collected a treasured set of opal earrings, a magnificent opal ring, and a gorgeous opal necklace. The woman placed her opal jewelry in a safe deposit box. She decided to wear opals only on special occasions. Many years passed. No occasion was deemed just right, just special enough to wear the opals. Finally, the wedding of her own daughter drew near, and the woman decided the time had arrived. With unbearable excitement, the woman went to the vault, removed the necklace, earrings, and ring from the box, and the opals crumbled in her hands. The woman had been so busy collecting the jewelry, she had failed to learn that opals need to be worn. They need the oils of the skin in order to retain their luster and their strength, for it is the warmth of the body, the touching, which gives them life and beauty. Friends, we can't keep our God, our, our spirituality, locked away in a box somewhere, expecting the Holy One to work at moments of crisis or tragedy, for our beliefs too may crumble. We can't manipulate God to be a cosmic bellhop ready at our beck and call. When God and spirituality are integral to our daily lives, filled with prayer and study and meaning and acts of justice, then our spirituality too can be filled with life and beauty. Amen.